Hello again. It's great to see you. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. If you're using the Bible on the pew in front of you, if you didn't have a chance to bring one, grab that today. Take that as our gift for you today. I'd love for you to have that as our gift. That's on page 846. 846, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. This is where we'll start, and then we're going to talk about several other passages today. So we're in a series that we're calling False Gospels, uncovering the real truth about the good news. Today's false gospel is called the Jesus Genie Gospel. The Jesus Genie Gospel. You can already smell what I'm stepping in, can't you? Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 31. Let's read that and then we'll begin, okay? As he was setting out on his journey, that is Jesus, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to them, Then who could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Lord, I pray for your humility today and submission to your word and submission to you as Lord. Um, Lord, I pray for my friends. I pray that you'd give me a heart of love for them uh, more and more, that you would help me to pour myself out for them as their pastor Um, and that you would put a heart of love in our heart for one another, that we would pour ourselves out for each other to provide for one another and care for one another and, and bend over backwards to make sure one another is doing well in all ways of life and especially spiritually. And Lord, there are, there are some, maybe even here today, that, that say they believe in you but don't really want to do anything for you. Um, and so we're so tempted to do that, Lord. We, want to, we, we love the things that you do for us and we ask you to, to bless us and to save us and to take us to heaven and all these wonderful things. Lord, but would you remind us who you really are? You're the king. You're the Lord of lords. Would you help us to make that commitment today, Lord? Not just to ask you to save us, but to entrust our whole lives to you as our master. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't made that commitment at all, I pray that you, would, that you would draw them to do that. And would you show us areas in our lives today that we haven't entrusted to you, areas that we want to be the king over. Would you show us that we've got to submit that to you and let you take control in that way. So we ask that your word would shine forth across this city and this country and across the world today as people proclaim it for your glory, for Christ's sake. Amen. 
So how you doing? Good. I love you guys. I love you. And um, I know it's my job to shepherd, shepherd you, to pastor you. And Jesus poured out his life for the sheep. And I know that's my calling. I want to be better at that. So pray for me that I would do that better. Sometimes my natural inclination in preaching is kind of prophetic. You know, I, I have a prophetic edge to my preaching, and that's just natural. Pray that I would have more of a pastoral heart, because I really need that for you. Um, so pray for that for me. I'm a broken person, in case you didn't figure that out yet. In case the balding hair didn't include you in. Um, okay, let's begin. I read a story on Facebook recently about um, this young man who was removed from the membership of his local congregation. He was practicing a lifestyle that the Bible condemns as sinful. And the, the local church there said, look, we can't affirm your walk with Christ by having you be a member here while you refuse to actually live for Christ. And I think that's the right thing to do. You see that in the New Testament. That's what membership is in part. And so they, they didn't say you can't come here anymore. Of course not. We want anyone to come here. They didn't say you can't come here. They said you can't live this way and call yourself a Christian. Which is true. The backlash of that was really astounding. If you really believe the Bible, it's astounding. There's a news reporter that picked the story up and did an interview with this young man. And was like, what's going on here? Tell us about this. And, and it just went crazy, you know, on Facebook. And people were condemning the church. You're like, this is, why would you ever do this to somebody? And a friend of mine posted this and posed the question on Facebook. Is this really what Jesus would do? Would Jesus ever tell somebody, no, you can't live your life this way and still call yourself a follower? Would Jesus really do that? We have this perception of what Jesus is like. Jesus is like this hippie. You know, who would be a great pot smoking partner at Bonnaroo or something, you know. He's never going to condemn anyone at all. He's never going to say anything bad about anyone. He's just, oh, it's just all love and butterflies and potato chips. Can you track it with me in the balcony? Um, so this is what we think Jesus is like. This is our perception of what Jesus is like. And no, Jesus would never tell anybody that, that their behavior is wrong. You know, Jesus would never tell anybody that they have to change. Jesus would never do that. He's all about love and acceptance acceptance and tolerance in every way possible. This is what we think Jesus is like. Hmm. Leroy Fourlines and others call this easy believism. Easy believism. I call it the Jesus genie gospel. If you're taking notes today, and I encourage you to do so in your program, if you're taking notes, the Jesus genie gospel is this. Here's the main characteristic, if you will. Jesus is someone to serve us. Not someone to serve. Jesus is here to make all our dreams come true. So what do you do? You go to church a little bit. You tithe a little bit. You take communion. You pray a little bit. You do all the things. You jump through the hoops. that Whatever the hoops you think they are. You jump through the hoops and appease Jesus. And then he'll make your life awesome. You know, Like a genie in a bottle. You just take it out whenever you really need something. And you say, alright Jesus, I'm ready for that new job. I'm ready for that better relationship. I'm ready for everything to go well in my life. I'm ready for heaven now, Jesus. And then whenever he's done granting your wish, all right, go back in the bottle and leave me alone. Let me live my life the way I want to live it, Jesus. I'm happy for you to be my Savior and get me to heaven, Jesus. But I'm not happy if you want to be my Lord, Jesus. The Jesus genie gospel. Here's some characteristics. I think these will be on your screen for you, all right? The person who believes in the Jesus genie gospel would claim they really believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus, absolutely. Who doesn't believe in Jesus? Who doesn't want to go to heaven, right? Of course I believe in Jesus. And most Americans claim they believe in Jesus. However, another characteristic is that this kind of person will reject part of Jesus' teaching that they don't like very much. I don't like what Jesus says about sexuality, 
when he said, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two should become one flesh. I don't like what Jesus says about that because it doesn't affirm my natural inclinations. And so I'm going to reject that part of Jesus and reject that part of the Bible. I don't like what Jesus says about marriage in general. And so I'm going to reject what he said about that. And I'm going to keep living with my boyfriend and girlfriend. I'm not going to let him be the Lord of that part of my life. I don't like what Jesus said about caring for the poor. And so I'm going to reject that part of what he said and I'm going to take all the good parts that I like that reject the part of Jesus' teaching that makes them uncomfortable. The third characteristic, they're willing to serve Jesus or the church so long as it meets their agenda. I'm happy to serve you, Jesus, as long as the things you want me to serve are the things I really know are the most important, Jesus. And the fourth thing, they're really unconcerned about living for Christ, about living a holy life. They say, oh, Jesus has died on the cross to save me from my sins only by his grace. And that's true. Therefore, it doesn't really matter how I live my life. It's the Jesus genie gospel. What are you doing for me today, Jesus? Because I'm sure not going to do anything for you. There's a theological offshoot of this. If you're a theology person, raise your hand. You say, I'm a theology person. Raise your hand. Okay, one person, two people. I love your honesty. I just need to take out all the theology from here on out, right? All right, bear with me here. I went to seminary for a reason. We paid all this money. So here's a word for you. Write this word down. Here's the theological word for this. It's called anti anti nomianism N-O-M-I-S-I-S, something like that. Just try to spell it out. And what that basically means is that it's against the law, against the law of God. It says, because Christ has saved me, now it doesn't matter how I live my life. It's against the law. And Paul wrote about this. Oh man, since Jesus saved me by his grace, why does it matter how I live? It's the Jesus genie gospel. Are you with me? Don't be scared. Say yes. Are you with me? Yes. Thank you. Come on now. You're going to have to help me out. You'll need to relax a little bit. There you go. The problem, here's the problem, guys, with the Jesus genie gospel. The problem with the Jesus Genie Gospel is it has a false view of what Jesus is really like. It thinks, it says that Jesus is this guy who's just there to grant all of our wishes. And because it has a false view of what Jesus is really like, it then changes how we engage with Jesus. Are you with me? So if Jesus is just a genie and he's there to grant all your wishes, then you don't really have to worship him. You just got to take him out of your pocket whenever you need something. You can still be the Lord of your life with the Jesus Genie Gospel. You can still be your own king, your own master. doesn't matter if you... And actually, if you treat Jesus as a king or as your master, with a, if, you, if, he's, if he's really just a genie, then you're being kind of silly. Why would you live your life for a genie? No. You're the one who controls him. See, a false view of who Jesus is leads us to actually... Engage with him in the wrong kind of way. So the question is, if this is really what Jesus is like, how should we live? And if Jesus is something really different than that, how does that change how we approach him? If Jesus is more than that, then it changes what we do with Jesus. Mm. What I want us to consider from the Bible, this text, and through other parts of Scripture today is, what is Jesus really like? Here's the question to write down. What is Jesus really like? And once we see what he's really like, we've got to ask, what do I need to do in response? If Jesus is like this, then what do I need to do? What is Jesus really like? Okay, in Mark 10, here's this story. This story is of this rich, young ruler. He is... Wealthy, and he is respected in Jewish communities. And he comes to Jesus, and he probably heard about Jesus in some kind of way. And he gets down on his knees in front of Jesus, and he says, A good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? 
Baptist really shows that he doesn't really quite understand Jesus yet, right? Because you don't do anything. You just receive who Jesus is. And so Jesus says, well, what are the commandments? And he says, so Jesus gives them six out of the ten commandments, all having to do with things that do uh, the way you treat other people and leaving the four out that, that uh, talk about how you treat God. So this guy says, yeah, I've done these since I was a kid. I haven't killed anybody. You know, I haven't committed adultery. I've, I've been doing pretty good. And Jesus understood the man's heart. And he loved him, it says. And he said, there's one thing you lack. He says, go and take all your possessions and get rid of all of them. And then give the money to the poor. And if you do that, then you'll be in the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus isn't promoting this works-based kind of righteousness, like if you jump through these hoops and you go to heaven. You know, that's not true. Don't think that you go to heaven because you take communion or because you're a churchgoer, okay? It doesn't work like that. Now, however, this man's refusal to do this revealed something about his heart condition. It revealed that what he truly valued above everything else was not Christ, but his money. That's why he wasn't willing to do it. He was loaded. He went away sad. Oh, Jesus says, I've got to go to heaven. If I'm going to go to heaven, I've got to get rid of this. But this is heaven to me. So I'm not going to get rid of it. And so he showed that he didn't really love the Lord as God above everything else. He actually had another God in his heart. His money, his wealth, or maybe what his wealth could give him. So he went away sad. That kind of Jesus... The Jesus that says, unless you give up everything and follow me, is not a Jesus genie. <laughs> you track it with me? That is a Jesus that says, unless you forsake everything else, you cannot be my disciple. And there's other instances when he says something like that. In the Bible, Luke chapter 14, Jesus said that if you don't love him so much that it makes your love for your family look like hate then you can't be his disciple. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, whoever does not take up his cross and follow him is not worthy of him. That's like saying, unless you're willing to go to the lethal injection chamber, then you're not worthy of following me, says Jesus. That doesn't sound like a genie to me. Early in his ministry, Jesus found people selling things in the temple perverting the temple and, and, and hurting poor people by charging them too much inside the temple. Meaning that it's like a, it's like a former Roman Catholic thing, you know? You've got to pay money to get your relatives out of hell, you know? And that's what these people are doing. And so Jesus takes this whip and he whips them and he gets them out of the temple. Can you imagine the fire in your genie's eyes as he takes this whip and kicks over tables and says, get out of here! doesn't sound like that nice kumbaya kind of man to me, you know? Jesus approached a woman who was essentially a prostitute at a well one time. You remember the woman at the well story? We love that account because of how kindly he approaches the woman. You see, he approaches her at the middle of the day and everybody knew that she's basically a prostitute and there's no way a Jewish man would approach a woman like this in this instance. And we love that. We love that Jesus did that to the woman because it means that he cares about us even in our brokenness. But we forget what he told the woman after he gave her the water of life. What did he say? Go and sin no more. We don't like that, Jesus. Jesus railed against religious leaders called the scribes and the Pharisees, giving them seven woes. He condemns them to hell, basically. In Matthew chapter 23, calling them serpents in front of everybody. Jesus fed 5,000 people, as recorded in, as recorded in John chapter 6, rec fed 5,000 people. Later, that crowd followed Jesus. Okay, so you hear this free meal time, you know, a free meal, Jesus. And so all these people hear about him, and they start following around and looking for him. And he calls them out. He said, the reason you're following me is because your belly's full, not because you care about me. I'm not a genie. You want to just take all the benefits from me and, and not live your life for me? I'm not about that. And he sends him away. He says, look, you had this bread that I gave you. Look, you know what the real truth about me is, says Jesus? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And those people are like, whoa, that's, 
That's kind of weird. Eating your body? I think I'm going to go find somebody else who can give me a free meal. The hard sayings of Jesus show that he's not just this guy who does these really great things for us. And if you'll just quote unquote believe, then you get to heaven. He's much more than that. We love that Jesus is our Savior. He's the one who saves us from our sins. Do you know the number of times Jesus is referred to as Savior in the New Testament? Anybody want to take a guess? Take a guess? Six times Jesus is referred to as Savior in the New Testament. How many times is He called Lord in the book of Matthew alone? Thirty times. We love that He's a Savior. Don't like it so much when he says that he wants to be the Lord. Revelation 19, John had a vision at the end of time. He saw this image of Christ. Just listen to this, okay? This is crazy. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's Jesus. That's the picture of the coming, returning Lord of every single person who's ever existed. And we want to talk about Jesus. Oh, I really like, I, re I really want a good day today, Jesus. I just, I just need a little more money. So, if you, you know, I'll just pray to you and I'll go to church more if you just give me a little more money, Jesus. You know? I don't really want to do anything for you, Jesus. I don't want you to have control of my life, Jesus. I just really like the cool things you can do because you're really powerful and you fed people and stuff. If you believe, here's a, here's a point I want you to write down, okay? If you believe in a Jesus who's different than what Scripture describes, then you believe in a Jesus who doesn't exist. If you believe in a Jesus who's different than Scripture describes, you believe in somebody who doesn't exist. You say you believe in a Jesus who would never call you to die to your way of living and follow Him. You believe in a Jesus that doesn't exist. That's not Jesus. C.S. Lewis famously said in the balcony, famously said, he said, look, there's only three options for how you can approach Jesus. You can, he's either a liar because of the things he said. He claims he's God. He does all these miracles. He's either a liar and he's just, you know, full of it. Or he's a lunatic. He's mentally insane and he actually thinks he's God. He actually thinks all these things are true. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's actually the Lord. Of everything. There's only three options. And the Jesus genie gospel says, no, I want to create a fourth version. A fourth way to respond. How do you do it? By reshaping who Jesus is entirely. Look, if you're going to reject Christianity, reject it on its own terms, please. What does the Bible really say about who Jesus is? And if you're going to claim to be a Christian, claim it on its own terms. Don't just pick and choose the parts of it that you like. Hmm. How many times, guys? Listen, how many times when people are confronted with difficult truths about God, like His sovereignty, or His holiness, or the fact He allows Christians, and even causes Christians to suffer for His name, or the fact He doesn't approve of everything that feels so natural to us, how many times... Do we say, you know, I could never believe in a Jesus who does that sort of thing? Well, the question is, what is he really like? You can't. If Jesus is like that, then it changes how you approach him entirely. Look, he's the king. 
Are you alive today? He's the king. He's not a genie you can pick up and choose and take things from and, and, you know, twist things around. He's the Lord of everything. Jesus is not in a bottle right now waiting for somebody to call him out and grant their every wish. Jesus is on the throne of heaven right now as the Lord of everyone and the king of everything. And the highest respected people that we know in our country and in the history of civilization are one day going to get on their face before this king. What do we need to do? I mean, I want to cut right to the point, all right? What do we need to do? If Jesus is a king and not a genie, then we got to take everything we are and everything we have and say, you take this, Lord. You take everything I've got. Everything, all my desires, all my hopes, all my dreams, all my skills, all my abilities, everything I've got, all my money, and you just take it and you use it for however you want. However you want me to live my life, that's how I want to live. If Jesus is really a king, then our approach to him is not to call on him whenever we need something. It is to bow our faces before him. And say, Lord, I'm yours. Just use me however you want. Let Jesus be who he really is. The king. Let him be the king in your life. You are not a Christian unless you do so, friends. There's, listen, listen. I know this is probably pretty heavy today. There's no such thing as Jesus saving someone from hell who has not also let let him be their master. Jesus is not going to be your savior unless you let him be your Lord. You're not going to heaven unless you entrust your whole life to him, unless you make him your master. That's what a Christian is. That's what a disciple is. You've got to let him be your Lord. How many of you guys know Tom Zappa? Raise your hand with me. I love Tom Zappa. He's not even here. I love Tom Zappa. He's really awesome. Tom, have you ever heard Tom Zappa tell his conversion story? The time when he came to know Christ personally? If you haven't, then ask him about it. It's really, it's really a great story. Tom was raised Catholic. Uh, I don't know if he was a good Catholic boy. Diane was, Diane, was he a good Catholic boy? Pretty good, yeah. You know, <laughs> six out of ten, you know. Okay. So Tom, he's a pretty good, normal Catholic kid. You know, knows all the Catholic things. And... Um, One of his friends confronted him one day and said, Tom, are you a Christian? He said, well, I believe in Jesus. And his friend said, well, so does Satan. (laughs) And that kind of started this slew of events that God started to get Tom's attention in his life. And Tom started to pray more and read the Bible more and things like that. He actually started to pursue God. And he he told me, he said, said, I pray this over and over. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. But he never really got that sense that Jesus was really in his heart. You know, he never really got that sense that he really knew Christ personally. Jesus saved me. Jesus prayed that all the time, you know. He said, but it actually happened one day. I've been praying Jesus saved me all this time until it finally happened when I said, okay, Jesus, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. And that's when Tom Zappa was converted. You see, you can't have Jesus as your Savior unless you let Him be your Lord, too. You can't have the benefits of the relationship with Christ unless you let Him be your Master. Who is Jesus to you today? Just this guy who just shows up every now and then whenever you really need something? Or is He your King? Only one of those is a true Christian, friends. You've got to let him be your king. You've got to make him your king over everything. It doesn't mean you're perfect, by the way. I'm not a perfect person. Poe Buddy's nerfect, like I always say. Look, it doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you entrust everything to him. It means you you take everything you are and you say, I'm just going to lay this down before you, and I'm going to let you do with me what you want to do with me, period. That means if you say, go over here, I'm going over there. You mean, that means if you say, do this job, it means I'm doing this job. Hmm. This is really good news. Listen, 
Here's why this is really good news. Why is Jesus making your king good news? Because I make a really bad king. Can I just confess that to you? I'm a really bad king. If I was the king, everybody would be Tennessee volunteer football fans. You know? And everybody would like flan from Mexican restaurants. You know? And stupid things like that. Everybody would be here to serve me and build up my ego. And I would hurt people and abuse people and do horrible things. I know I would. This is why, I mean, American government, right? We have three branches to keep people from abusing power. We know that people make terrible kings. Even throughout Israel's history, even the good ones, David is killing people to commit adultery, you know? We make terrible kings. This is good news for you to let Christ be your king. Because here's a king that's so good. He's eternally good. He's so perfect and holy and wonderful and right. And every decision he ever makes is the right one. It's so good to just let this man, this God, let him take control. And it's so freeing and it's so wonderful and it's so peaceful if you would just let him be your king. Mm. I make a terrible king. And just knowing you the little bit I know, I think you make a pretty bad king too. There's this king though who loved his people so much. Loved his people so much. When they were enslaved in bondage to another leader. Came down and humbled himself and took on our sin on the cross. And totally defeated every enemy he's ever faced. By triumphing over them in the cross and rising again from the dead. That's how much this king cares for you. Look, why don't you let him be your king? Jesus isn't in a bottle. He's not in a bottle. He's on the throne of heaven. Why don't you let him be on the throne of your heart, friends? That's what we're called to do today. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father and righteous King over all creation. Lord, I want to submit parts of my life to you that I've been holding myself, my time. I've been not using it well. I want to submit that to you today and ask you to work in me that you would take reign over that part of my life again and, and renew that part of my life, Lord, so I can spend it for you and your kingdom. And Lord, my friends here today, many of us have made us your, you our king and, and you've been incredible. Lord, would you remind us of how good you are and that, that you're, you're, you've got under, things under control. Would you remind us of that today? Maybe there's parts of our lives as Christians that we need to submit to you and let you be the king over. Whatever that is, Lord, I pray that you would please do that as we hear the piano playing. And Lord, if there's any here today who have, man, they've, they've viewed you as Savior and they've asked you to save them, but they've never actually given over their life to you. And said, here I am, Lord. You take all of me and you do it. You do with me what you want. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't done that yet, would you show them how good of a king you can be in their lives? Would you show them the hope of heaven, the the joy of your kingdom, even as you bring it to earth right now, Lord? Uh, Work in their hearts. And work in us as we seek to build your kingdom here. Help us to be willing to give up everything for you because you're the treasure in the field that is beyond everything we could ever value, Lord. Pray that you would honor your name in this place. For Christ's sake, amen.